Welcome back, guys, to the JPS podcast. And we have another Q&A. And this time, myself and Brian Miner answer a number of questions asked by our mentorship students. And a lot of these topics are very important and relevant to many of you. So I'm sure you'll take a lot away from this. A few little housekeeping notes. The mentorship enrollment is officially open. So if you're a personal trainer looking to take your game to the next level and raise the standard of your coaching, be sure to check it out. And the link to that is in the description box below. So without further ado, let's get into things and tackle all the questions asked by our mentorship students, ranging from periodization, tracking training volume, post-competition training strategies, how to deal with eating disorders, loose skin, and many, many more. So guys, I hope you enjoy this episode. If you do, be sure to like it, subscribe to the channel, and enjoy. We are back and we're doing take two of this question because I'm an absolute numbskull and forgot to press record. So Brian, how do you periodize and structure your programs? For example, do you divide them into phases like Mike Isratel uh, with more volume in the end of a mesocycle or do you keep the volume the same um, throughout the program with eventual changes in exercise selection and adjusting volume through feedback of the client? And part two of the question is, do you use more double progression than single progression? Um, so, I, yeah, there's the few questions here and it's going to be impossible to answer everything in detail and all of the context um, that could be you know, required to make these decisions. Um, but the, the answer is, is, is there's not just one way. Um, I would say for physique athletes, I tend to use a strategy that's more accruing training volume across mm-hmm. the mesocycle. Um, strength athletes, you know, I may structure the mesocycle you know, with a, you know, first half of it's accumulating volume, and then we see a more assertive increase in intensity, the second half with a drop in volume. And so it ends up being a slight, like, linear trend, linear relationship between volume and intensity. Whereas some of these accumulation um, cycles where you're accumulating volume, you may keep, you know, if you're using, like, a double progression scheme, you may see loads stay the same same intensity you know kind of stay the same throughout the mesocycle um, with you know added sets so it depends on the goal Um, but I would say even if even with a strength focus goal where you have a linear trend across the block you want to make sure you're looking at it through a wide lens um, and understanding that just because you know volume sort of reduces throughout the block or you know trends down towards the end doesn't mean that it's not effective for hypertrophy um, because we want to look at mesocycle to mesocycle. So we sort of think of it as like your average amount of volume in block A versus, you know, say then you increase your, um, you know, your absolute strength, your 1RM, you're now pulling from higher, you know, lifting heavier for the same sets and reps. Um, and so that's going to increase, you know, your training stress as well. And so you want to look at the progression from mesocycle to mesocycle Um, rather than necessarily week to week Uh, but you can do that as well um, in those those phases but I would say you know with strength athletes where we're trying to even within a volume focused phase keep some level of um, you know higher intensity proficiency in the lift I may have that phase where it sort of serves as like a little mini um, taper you know at the end of the block or a mini like two week strength phase you know within the mesocycle itself Mm -hmm. Um, and so it it can be useful. You want to take client preferences into account. Um, you know, the joint integrity of the athlete, you know, that you may be in a situation where progressing reps is, you know, or adding sets is a better, safer use of your time, um, than adding load. So there's a lot to consider there, but, you know, double progression and single progression, I use, use both of those double progression more for, um, you know, accessory or isolation movements, um, single progression. If we're, you know, looking at the variable of load, you know, I, I usually progress, if I'm progressing load week to week on something, it's generally a, a heavier compound lift or a competition lift if it's a power lifter. Mm-hmm. Um, and then double progression. If you go, you know, sometimes you have to make that range pretty wide, say lateral raises, um, 
you know, if you're using 20 pounds and you get to the top end of your rep range across each set and you go to 25 pounds, that's a 25% increase in, in load. And so you may see, like if you had a range of 12 to 15, your first set with the 25 the week following may end up being at like a, you know, eight reps. And so the larger the relative increase in load with the double progression scene, typically the wider I make that range um, to accommodate being able to perform at the bottom end of the range um, once you do increase the load. Uh, but yeah, that's a great question. And these are, these are things that I'll, I'll kind of hash out in more detail within the programming modules um, in the future. Cool. Second question. Haven't had much experience with this yet, but how would you go about dealing with clients, in particular females after pregnancy, uh, who've, who have quite a significant amount of leftover uh, loose skin? Brian? Um, you know, I, I don't have, I wouldn't say a, a large degree of experience um, with this situation, but the, you know, the, the experience I do have you know, just resistance training and controlling the rate of loss seem to, to both help. Um, you know, in theory anyway, the, you know, more rapidly you lose weight, um, the less time your skin has to adjust um, and, you know, gain back some of its um, properties. So it, it, it's one of those situations, it's heavily based on anecdote. I know Jacob, the the first time we did this Q and A, <laughs> you, had, you had mentioned you know you thought age had a, a big impact on it, which I think is is true. Uh, you know the uh, um, older you are, oftentimes less pliable your skin can be in returning to its shape. How long you've been overweight um, or, or you know pregnancy, obviously it's you know you you're in that state for um, a relatively like the really stretched out state for, you know, it's a while, but it's not like somebody who's been obese for five years, you know? So it's, I think in females, it's, you know, with pregnancy, I would imagine it's a bit less of an issue than it is with obese um, clients, but it's a great question. And I think it, it, you know, resistance training, controlling the rate of loss. And then, you know, I think those are kind of within the context of yeah but they can't change their age so it's those are the ones that you have in your control so. and and don't do two silly things such as get pregnant or get stupidly <laughs> overweight right <laughs> yeah. next, next question <laughs> trying, to, trying to make light of the situation guys <laughs> we were like 30 minutes in i'm sorry um cool so for those battling with no appetite whatsoever and can go the whole day without feeling hungry or wanting to eat, are there any strategies or even supplements that can stimulate their appetite with the other variables being covered thoroughly as well, like reduced training volume, rest, recovery, and mentality, et cetera? You want to cover this one since I did the last two or do you want me to tackle? Yeah, yeah, I can uh, tackle this one. So I guess, uh, you know, with appetite, um, you know, it's always – tough trying to you know gain weight with no appetite obviously we need to eat at a calorie surplus and i treat it much like we do when we're trying to diet for weight loss um nobody wants to diet for weight loss and if you're somebody who's struggling with appetite and weight gain um you know you need to do what you don't necessarily want to do which is eat so what i find uh, the case in many situations with people who have no appetite or a low appetite um, is that they're just not interested in food. And for whatever reason that is, they might be really busy people. Uh, they might just not care for food. Uh, they might be stressed, anxious, um, and things like this. So in terms of strategies to stimulate appetite, um, you know, I know that one, you mentioned training volume being reduced could be one of them. And in some cases that's, that's true, but Exercise can spark and ignite appetite for some people. So trial and error with that. Um, but finding foods that you do care for. So I mentioned that people don't, who struggle to gain weight usually don't care for food. So I think if you can find a few foods, whether it's two or three foods that you do care for and that you could eat, even though you don't necessarily feel you know, super hungry, um, eat those foods on a frequent basis. And like I mentioned you need to treat it like 
other people would treat losing weight. It's hard. Nobody wants to eat less calories than what they want. And in your case, you don't want to eat more calories than what you want, but you've got to do it. You've got to learn to delay the gratification uh, that comes uh, with dieting. So, you know, giving up what you want right now and you know potentially being a little bit uncomfortable eating more food um you know for achieving your goals and and gaining weight assuming that that is uh your intended goal here but yeah setting up the structure of your day with potentially uh you know a higher meal frequency if you know eating large meals you know really makes you feel sick and you don't want to eat for the rest of the day potentially having you know smaller more frequent meals over the day could be useful um but a lot of trial and error here i often advise my my guys who don't uh, eat enough to make a big smoothie that's very calorie dense um and this is where you know the palatability and density of our food um you know can really play in our favor so eating foods that you really like that are really nice but also very energy dense um, to get all the calories that we need in. So I tell my guys to make a big smoothie um, with full cream milk, honey, you know, oats, protein powder, ice cream, peanut butter, um, you know, avocado. So they get some micronutrients and things like this. Um, blend it all up. It'll be literally like over 3,000 calories for like three or four glasses. And if you have, you know, two to three glasses a day or, you know, with one other meal, like, you can you can meet some serious calories uh with that so i think that's a useful strategy as well so one thing uh that i'll add to that while you were talking i did since i i'm not aware of any supplements that help um i did some brief research here and it sounds like if you have a zinc deficiency that can um down regulate appetite so that might be something you know if you get blood work mm-hmm. done to to keep an eye on so Interesting. Awesome. awesome. You don't, you do not waste uh, a minute, Brian. That's very impressive. Um, <laughs> cool. Well, we're back up to where we were. So that's, that's, that's great news. That was- um, <laughs> I have a new client who has admitted to having disordered eating habits. She has admitted to punishing herself when she doesn't eat healthy foods or misses a training session by starving herself or training for hours on end. She's obese and struggles to eat regularly due to her work commitments, sporadic shift work. She's committed 100% to doing whatever it takes to lose weight and repair her relationship with food. I have provided her with a food diary to uh, to start so I can gain insight into her habits. Uh, What would be your best strategies to overcome this uh, on such a significant mental uh, barriers like this? Yeah, this, this is a tough one. I think, you know, any coach that's been doing this a while is going to have clients where this is a, the landscape of the situation. So, you know, I, I think the biggest thing within our scope that we can do is educate them on, you know, teach them how to think critically and be objective and at least be able to understand why, like the punishing herself with that, you know, skipping food or you know training hours on end why that's not a healthy approach or oftentimes necessary that can be helpful but you know in in the face of you know being objective if they if they're if they know what they're doing isn't necessary but they're still still doing it um then there's you know that's certainly a sign of some underlying disordered behaviors that you would want to have you know, a third party involved with helping um, to get through. So I would say don't be afraid to, you know, outsource that because, you know, we're not therapists, you know, we're not specialized in eating disorders, but we can um, certainly help people. Like, for example, some sometimes people will, you know, they'll try to do cardio to undo, you know, a thousand calorie meal you know say they went over calories by like a thousand the previous day and then they try to do you know an extra 45 minutes of cardio um you know understanding that like you're not going to be able it it, understanding and teaching them how this can become a cycle that's not healthy is is important Mm -hmm. Um, but you know how there's a concept out there um 
called the constrained energy model, which is a whole different topic. But there, there can actually be sort of a cap in your expenditure. Um, for people that are training hours on end, oftentimes they um, will like downregulate reproductive function and you hit a wall where you don't really burn more calories. Mm -hmm. um, and so the energy out does appear to eventually have sort of a ceiling um, in understanding like, okay, if I push to that ceiling, something else like reproductive function may suffer, you know, that, that could sort of help them be objective and realize, okay, this isn't the solution either. Um, but, you know, my biggest piece of advice is don't be afraid to, I mean, educate yourself as much as you can about disordered eating, but don't play the role of a qualified therapist in, in situations like this. Play the, play the role of educator. Yeah. Yeah. Spot on. Um, I would just, yeah, like Brian said, educate. So the first thing that sprung to me when I read this question um, was the use of the word healthy. Um, and then that essentially like that word is very loaded. So, you know, you need to find out what healthy means to her. Um, you know, is it controlling calories? Is it eating clean, quote unquote clean? Um, is it, you know, not eating processed foods? Like what does that, what does that mean to her? Um, and then you need to break down um, that notion of, you know, healthy um, and teach her, you know, what, what true health, actually is even though we probably can't give it an exact definition i'm sure her definition is different to yours um and you need to get on the same page before you can start you know providing some form of you know nutritional guidance or training program um because for her she's probably eating foods that are unhealthy by her own definition uh feeling really guilty and that's leading to, to her um, you know, starving yourself and training for hours on end. But if you can teach her that, okay, you know, there's no such thing as, you know, a healthy food, you know, we need to look at the context of your diet over days, weeks and months, you know, and your general health, you know, situation before we determine whether or not something's healthy or not, um, as well as, you know, the mindset behind it. And you can teach her all of these things and that, you know, one chocolate bar won't make her gain fat, but if she eats, you know, over a calories by a thousand every day for months on end. That's what will lead to fat gain. You can teach her all those things. Um, she might be less inclined to starve herself. And again, you know, teaching her that there's the ceiling, like Brian said on, you know, our energy expenditure and that cardio doesn't actually burn, um, you know, as many calories as what we think when we look at, um, you know, the totality of our energy expenditure, because we probably have some compensatory effects. Um, you know, it also substitutes the exercise, or the activity and the calories we would have burnt otherwise during that time frame, um, unless she's doing, you know, hours and hours per day, um, which she, it says she is, but you know, I don't, I don't think she'll be burning as many calories as what she thinks. So uh, teaching her that potentially, you know, exercising for hours on end isn't going to be useful. Um, neither starving yourself because you're just going to do it again. Um, and that, you know, no such, Thing, there's no such thing as healthy foods and really starting to break down these kind of barriers and just educate about those three specific things initially. And then, you know, branching out to, to more of the details um, might help just, I guess, take the pressure off her so that she doesn't feel like she's got to, you know, be perfect with her diet, you know, train really hard all the time. Like teach her that she's not going to you know, gain weight if she doesn't exercise for one day. Or, you know, if she misses one session, she won't lose muscle. Like little things like this, like they go such a long way um, because people often really freak out and they feel they've got to do so much work to look a certain way and to lose weight um, that that stress is the problem in and of itself and causes them to, you know, um, self-sabotage. So, yeah, try to break down those barriers and, you know, take the pressure off her because I'm sure she's feeling, you know, she's working a lot as well. Like it sounds like this woman's highly stressed. So a bit of lifestyle management, you know, wouldn't go astray. Yeah. I think that one other thing to add there is just making them buy into a long-term solution to yeah. the problem. 
Um, cause you, you, you know, a lot of people that, that come to you wanting to lose weight, want to lose it as fast as possible. Um, mm -hmm. and, which leads to oftentimes that, that is one of the reasons they go to such extremes, um, to try to compensate for things. So getting them to buy into a, a long-term strategy and making them admit directly asking them, do you think this is a, you know, long-term sustainable strategy to manage this and making them realize like, well, yeah, of course not. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, well how, you know, here is how we can make it more sustainable. Um, and everything that, that you had mentioned as well. Basically. Yeah, I think that that's super important is the long term uh, process and buying into that. So I hope we answered that one. Next question. Do you think it's possible to maintain maximal one RM strength on the big three whilst losing muscle mass? This is a really uh, cool question. And how yeah. long could you maintain one RM strength whilst completing low volume training that's insufficient to maintain muscle mass? Or another way to put it, theoretically, how long could you stay peaked for maximal strength if muscle is slowly being atrophied due to insufficient stimulus? And what would be the mechanisms at play? I'm not even going to touch this one, Brian, all yours, man. <laughs> um, yeah, this, this is an excellent question and there's not any firm answer well the first answer is is a firm yes I, it is certainly possible to to maintain strength or maintain strength while losing muscle up to a point i mean you could uh you know we i think i maybe mentioned this in the last q a i mentioned it recently somewhere but one of my favorite kind of analogies for expression of strength is from Mike Tashir where he discusses like the hardware and the software aspects of strength and, mm -hmm. um, or like the morphological versus the neurological contributors to strength. And, um, you know, with the more morphological ones, I mean, we have muscle hypertrophy, you know, things occurring in the muscle tendon unit, you know, pination angle, th things that are really downstream of, of hypertrophy, but really losing muscle mass is going to affect our strength after a while, um, or even in the short term, depending on the magnitude of loss. But there is an immensely large neurological component to strength um, in terms of, you know, intramuscular coordination, um, you know, motor recruitment. You see in beginners, a lot of their, you know, early increase increases um, in progress are strength related before they become um, before they start to develop size and build muscle and basically the the easy explanation for that is it's your body learning to utilize the the muscle um, fibers that it has at its disposal for force production before it then decides to hypertrophy those decides like it, it has a brain before it before it, you actually have the need to increase you know cross-sectional area of those muscle fibers um and so there's direct research that has actually looked at um you know programs with daily 1rm training and has seen increases in 1rm strength despite very low amounts of training volume um, the key here is to realize that this, you need to look at that in terms of time scale. How long would that be the case? Probably not very long. Um, because there is a, you do need a certain level in magnitude and duration of tension exposure to, to maintain muscle over time. But you can sort of think of it like as long as your neurological adaptations are, you know, outpacing the rate of atrophy, you know, if you could quantify mm -hmm. that, you're, you're going to s at least be able to maintain strength um, to a point. But, um, you know, how long could you maintain 1RM while completing low volume training? I think that depends heavily on the, the status of the athlete and how low the volume is. Um, you know, there, I think you can probably, in a I don't want to misquote the actual percentage and I'm not sure how they quantified volume here, but I believe there is some research where it shows people maintaining muscle off of like a third of the volume that they were doing to you know, create overload. Um, and so you can maintain muscle off surprisingly low amounts of volume in relation to what it takes to, to gain muscle. Um, 
So how long could you maintain one arm strength? I mean, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, you look at a program like Smolov, for example, the squat program where it basically kills you for three weeks straight and then you take an entire week off. Um, you know, during that week off, you probably, if you're going without strength training, you probably are experiencing like muscle protein breakdown is likely exceeding synthesis. Like we know protein synthesis has a time scale of anywhere from like 24 to 72 hours. And so if you go beyond that point and you're not training, um, you know, depending on the state of energy balance as well, you're, you're going to likely experience higher levels of skeletal muscle protein breakdown than you see, you know, have on the synthetic side of the equation. So, but this is a situation where it's like those adaptations, those neurological adaptations, you know, they, they trump the amount of, you know, atrophy, slight atrophy that may occur with that total week off. And I think, you know, one way that that program could probably be improved is like keep very low amounts of volume in on that last week enough to maintain, you know, that still helps dramatically reduce fatigue um, and, and maintains muscle while still reaping the benefits of the kind of the, the neurological adaptations and, you know, attenuating any atrophy that, that may occur. So, you know, I think it really just depends on the duration. I think anywhere from three to seven days, <clears throat> if, if people have like a total, um, you know, cessation of training for a peak um, with powerlifting, you know, I don't know anybody that really, you know, takes more than a few days completely off before a meet um, or a handful of people, but it's not common. Um, but you wouldn't see somebody take 14, you know, two, three weeks off of training. Um, so context needs to be applied to that question. Um, but I would say, you know, going, you know, three days to a week isn't going to result in significant enough atrophy to negate the effects of the neurological adaptations in most cases. Um, so yeah, great question. Very, very interesting. Um, an area that I'm especially interested in. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you know, the biggest predictive variable for uh, maximal strength as you progress as an athlete and at, at advanced levels is going to be, um, you know, development in hypertrophy. And so this isn't something, I think this is more of a theoretical question rather than something that people are trying to implement in practice. Um, but it's, it's an interesting nonetheless. Awesome. Cool. Um, how have you screened clients in the past and do you screen clients now? What has changed and why? And what do you recommend? I see some coaches use elaborate screening process, processes, while others uh, simply watch a client perform movement and then go from there. I know there is no way, uh, right or wrong way, but what do you guys personally recommend and why? I'll uh, kick this one off. Um, yes, I've screened clients and I do currently screen my clients now. Um, what has changed? I'm less rigid with how I screen my clients now. Um, and my, I guess, first session or consultation, I'll talk about the face to face screening that I use and then Brian can talk about how he does it online. Um, <clears throat> so I have a, you know, system, we have a system at JPS, you know, we have a screening process. So clients come in, they fill out their waivers. Um, we, you know, do a overhead squat to assess, you know, just uh, function at all the joints and then we'll go to sp any specific uh, joint uh, that, you know, seems to be problematic from there. Um, and then mind you, we're not trying to be physiotherapists here. We're just trying to see if they can actually move properly, um, you know, without pain, discomfort, have any injuries and things like that. Um, and then from there, we'll go down to the gym floor, teach them any uh, mobility and stability drills that they might need based on what, we, what we've seen in the assessment. For example, if we have someone who's, you know, lordotic, um, you know, they've got an anterior pelvic tilt, um, you know, we've identified that in the overhead squat. Um, we might go downstairs and start to teach them, you know, some glute activation drills, how to, you know, uh, breathe and brace properly, the Valsava, you know, maneuver and all this kind of stuff so that they can control their pelvis a little bit more to create that neutral spine. Um, and then get into, you know, a squat, a, a press, 
a row, a hinge, and just see the move on the, on the gym floor. So that's the general process and usually takes between, you know, 30 to 40 minutes uh, for the most part. Um, but now what I'll often do is if I have a client who, you know, I had a, a new client, I haven't been taking on new clients uh, for the past 12 months, but I had uh, one of uh, our students who uh, I've mentored and whatnot want to uh, start some coaching. And he came into the gym and I said, cool, what, what day are you meant to be training today? He's like, legs. And I said, great, let's get at it. See what you do, you know, follow your program and, you know, we'll go from there. So uh, my screening process now is very much dependent on who I'm working with. If I have someone who I know nothing about um, and I've got no idea and I think potentially there could be a lot of problems, um, you know, I use my intuition and, you know, I'll be a little bit more, uh, you know, involved in the screening process, so to speak. Um, than if I have someone who I know, uh, they lift. I'm sorry, my daughter's Yeah, Eden. Okay, can you please, can you please go and do this? <laughs> sorry, guys. Um, oh, I'll be here in a minute. Um, whereas if I have a new client who I might need to get some buy-in with, um, you know, and through their, you know, pro forma, uh, forms, you know, has outlined that they've had, you know, three knee surgeries, they've got a bulging disc, you know, ankle issues and all this sort of stuff. Um, I'll take a little bit more care and I'll go through the process of screening them um, a little bit more formally. Um, but in terms of what the overarching objective is, I just want to see if people can train properly or not, essentially, um, and whether or not they can move well, um, you know, what type of exercises are going to fit them best, whether it's a, you know, conventional deadlift, a sumo deadlift, um, you know, whether they, you know, actually need to bench press. If they're not a power lifter, then, you know, do they need to start with a barbell bench press, you know, um, and things like that. I think just looking at their movement as a whole is what I'm trying to, to get to really. Um, and as I've become more and more experienced, I realized that, yeah, Screening is not always, um, you know, it doesn't need to be as detailed or complex um, as what many people think. Um, and if you're in doubt, you're not sure, and you know, you want to learn more about it, um, you know, go speak to a physiotherapist. And that's what I did. So, you know, Chris, our physio who presents in the mentorship, I literally spent two years, you know, working with him, with my clients and picking his brain about, you know, freaking every joint in the body. He basically, I'd go in and get a massage every week and he'd give me, um, you know, basically a lecture on a joint um, and, you know, drills for that specific joint and, you know, just learning so that, you know, when I came up with this screening system, I knew how to use it. Um, and we teach our coaches, um, you guys who've been in the mentorship will know uh, what I'm talking about. But yeah, just learn, just learn more about, you know, the body anatomy, you know, function, dysfunction, mobility, stability, you know, all of those things. And at the end of the day, all we're trying to learn is what our clients can and what they can't do uh, and what's the best starting point for uh, their initial program that's going to be safe and effective. Um, so, yeah, Brian. Yeah, you hit that out of the park, man. That, I mean, that's I, – I don't have the experience you have with um, – you know, in-person training. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll offer a different perspective, you know, with the remote aspect. And I think most people, not all, but is a, is a generalization, people that end up seeking out remote personal training um, tend to, I think, on average, be more proficient in movements than those that would be going to a personal training studio, you know, never having trained before. Um, they oftentimes know their way around the gym. Um, and so this, the screening process then becomes like, okay, what, let's take a look at these movements. Um, and you can kind of tell um, in many cases, like if I see somebody squat and it looks very, very rough, <laughs> you know, the motor pattern just looks kind of like a train wreck then you it's it's often safe to assume like okay there, there's other things that we're going to have to pay a lot of attention to mm -hmm. um and so i mean that that is kind of 
I, I guess I, I don't have a specific process outside of, okay, let's, let's get video of the primary lifts that you're trying to improve um, or the core lifts in your program and make sure that you're doing them safely and, and targeting the um, muscle that you're after. But there are cases with people that, um, that are experienced, um, they're proficient in a lot of movements and there, it could just be one particular thing that um, needs tweaked on something. And I'll give a bit of a case study here on this is I had an athlete recently, a, a bodybuilder who, who came to me that, um, you know, he's been training for you know, 12 years, very, you know, I would consider him an advanced athlete um, who, you know, when, when we first started, you know, the um, enrollment process and the questionnaire, he mentioned to me, like, I, my pecs are very, it's a very, you know, stubborn body part. Um, this, you know, it's something that requires tons of volume to grow. And I asked him how much volume he was talking and he told me, and it, it was unbelievable amounts of volume. So, um, you know, rather than simply take his word for it, you know, I asked for some video and the way he was performing his presses was just not hitting his pecs. The, like it was a very simple fix. And so um, it's tricky with remote, his elbows basically were, mm -hmm. um, you know, weren't staying stacked underneath the bar or, or the dumbbell. They were, um, you know, drifting behind and it, he was getting a lot more shoulder than he was pec. Um, and so all of a sudden, you know, his perspective changed like, okay, now, you know, my, my volume tolerance is now very normal. Yeah. It's, it's, it's no longer. Yeah. Something. It's, it's so yeah. 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 So, so it's, it's, I guess I, I want to add that in because, you know, you can't, your chances are as a remote coach, you're not going to see every single lift that you program. I mean, you could, but it, it's not more often than not going to be the most efficient use of, of your time, um, you know, depending on the level of the athlete. But the, the more experienced the athlete, the less I ask to see like accessory lifts. Um, but I, I always do look, you know, for power lifters, certainly I get a look at their, um, their big three, you know, there's like the wall test for ankle mobility that you can mm -hmm. do to assess, you know, okay, do they need a heeled shoe? Um, you know, how is their external, you know, rotation, like if they're experiencing elbow pain, um, or wrist discomfort with a low bar squat, let's look at that. And so a lot of it, I look at like, okay, are there any current aches and pains first and foremost? Um, if there are, let's troubleshoot, see what the, you know, if there's any obvious contributing factors to that. Um, but I would say with the remote aspect, it, it's not as much of a process as it is like an ongoing conversation that you have week to week. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's a lot harder to get somebody to go through. Um, it, it's not enough as efficient as you can make it in person. Like you can't, you know, have them do an overhead squat, pinpoint it, then show them a drill. Like you're talking about an email thread that's, you know, going back and forth constantly that that you know a lot of those people um are coming to you simply for a program to follow mm -hmm. in less of like learning how to do the movement and that's usually because they already know how to do the movement um you know one thing i will see you know for for a power lifter you know if i look at their main lifts and like they can't get into the bottom position of their deadlift without going into flexion um you know then I will say, okay, let's look at some hamstring flexibility tests. Let's see if that's the limiting factor. Let's see if it's that you're just simply, you know, your technique just needs an overhaul. But oftentimes, you know, technique is going to be limited by mobility um, and not the other way around. So it's, it's something you, you just kind of have to do on the fly. At least that's how I do it is, is, you know, let's start small, let's fan out from there. Are there any, you know, are there any issues that you're having currently? How can we potentially address those? Mm -hmm. um, and there's cases where you get to the bottom of it. And, you know, like we talked about with the disordered eating, where you have to outsource to like a physiotherapist um, to, to address like some underlying issues. It's like 
a hip shift in a squat, if you screen them and their squat has a hip shift, um, you know, you can do with, with you know, what, with in your knowledge to see like, okay, here's some things to troubleshoot. Is it a motor control issue? Is something tight? You know, if you try rolling this, does that, um, or releasing, you know, whatever, does that help? Um, and oftentimes you go through those processes and they still have the shift and there, you know, there can be a number of contributing factors for that. So it's much harder to assess something like that remotely. But um, yeah, I think when possible, at least get video of the main lifts. Um, ask if there's any you know, recurring discomforts. Um, you know, for, for a lot of lifters, you know, external rotation and, um, you know, hip mobility is, is are the big the big ones that i you tend to oftentimes have to kind of go back to yeah awesome awesome and i think um also with online clients like just make sure you like brian said he sends out questionnaires and stuff just make sure that they ask the right questions and that you know i i guess i don't know how you do it brian but if someone sends me back a half-assed questionnaire i send it back and say cool i need more information um yeah you know, maybe there's just like areas that they haven't really fleshed out. So I guess being more, um, yeah, vigilant with what information you're looking to get with your clients. Mm -hmm. Cool. Brian, what are your favorite resources on periodization? And have you read super training worth a read or overhyped? I've actually got it here and I've never read it from start to finish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, super training is, it's it's almost like a trophy on everyone's bookshelf that <laughs> mine's, mine's <laughs> nobody's actually point. earned by reading it. Um, no, I, I you're not going to get anything out of super training that you couldn't get, you know, reading other resources. Greg Knuckles' um, website. Yeah, Greg Knuckles' website, Stronger by Science, is excellent um, in terms of you know periodization. Um, yeah, I mean, there's like one of the resources I used when I first started learning about um, programming was like Mike Tashir has a classroom thing with RTS, mm -hmm. which is good and teaches how, you know, about programming. That's, that's an excellent one. Um, but I think, you know, yeah, Greg's website's probably one of the best. Um, yeah, super training. If if you don't already own it, I wouldn't say you need to buy it. I wouldn't really even recommend it because um, it, it's good information, but it's not. I think a lot of people approach that, that book, try to read it cover to cover, and mm. it they don't end up getting anywhere. And a lot of the stuff in super training is catered more towards like sports performance than it is, you know, body composition and um, you know, maximal strength, like for power lifters. So, and, you know, keep in mind, it's like since super training has been written, there's been a, a lot of new research that's been done. I mean, I, how old is super training? Does it say in there? Is it probably 30 years old? It's old. 99. Okay. So 20 years old, 20 years old. So oh, it's got to be longer. A than lot that. of advances has, have been. Yeah. Oh, oh no. 93, bro. First edition, okay. was 93. Bit, yeah. This is the fourth edition. So first edition okay. was 93. Okay. So point being is that there's emerging research that's been performed since then. Um, you know, I think Greg, yeah, Greg's website, Mass, um, the research review that Greg, Eric Helms, and Mike Zoros have is, is good. Um, they, they cover topics, you know, beyond just simply periodization. But the end of the day it's like periodization it creates a model framework i think in mm -hmm. thinking more than it does tells you a way to program so uh, that's ultimately how i would kind of frame it um you know going in learning about this is it's it's not going to tell you necessarily how to train it's going to give you programming theory um and what research we have to to back up theories um but I think, yeah, Strength and Conditioning Journal is probably yeah. one of the best. I mean, the, the best way to learn about programming is to actually read the research. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, searching for the actual studies, um, 
you know, find out who is, you know, with regards to like Zordos, like read everything that Mike Zordos has ever written. Um, read, you know, Brad, all of Brad Schoenfeld's research. Um, and, and that's going to give you a, a, a good start. Um, James Krieger's research review is excellent in terms of um, just training methodologies and training principles. Um, but yeah, favorite resources are the actual research at this point anyway. Awesome. I concur with all of the above. In regards to physique athletes, I think this is the last question. What is your go-to approach for tracking training volume for muscle groups, uh, hard sets, total tonnage, total sets, and reps? You want me to go? Uh, I'll, I'll answer first, but I just use hard sets. Um, hard sets per week, uh, per muscle group, with a few caveats, obviously, uh, between the th 3 to 30 rep range, uh, with an RP of 6 or more. So that sort of takes care of the uh, intensity uh, component. Um, so yeah, that's how I track volume. Um, in terms of progressing volume, like Brian said in the early questions, I don't necessarily um, you know, add sets every mesocycle. Um, I'll more specifically look at, you know, are we increasing the volume um, you know, over the course of time? Um, and in many cases, you know, the need for more hard sets per week um, isn't going to increase as much as what people think, um, you know, especially when they're getting towards uh, the advanced level, you're probably going to have to have blocks where you have, uh, you know, a specific focus on a muscle group uh, where, you know, you have some muscle groups on maintenance volumes and then uh, some muscle group or well, the muscle group that you want to bring up uh, will have significantly more volume uh, because it's, you're specializing uh, for that muscle group. So yeah, hard sets. That's how I do it. Brian, anything you want yeah, to add? Yeah, I mean, that, I, I think that's probably the best way in practice. Um, I think the absolute best way, which is harder to, to mm. quantify on the fly is like effective reps. Um, or James Krieger's like hypertrophy volume load is would be an excellent way um, to track. But existing ways that I do it, yeah, hard sets is good. And I, I think the biggest thing is, you know, tracking volume, it doesn't need to like I, I used to have these Excel spreadsheets that would make everything it it, it created the illusion that you know I was able to make the smallest tweak to things it's like okay well if i increase your volume three percent this week then you know this is going to happen and i mean the charts and graphs are cool to look at and cool equations to calculate volume you know they're cool but the longer i coach the more i realize that you know you're it kind of just boils down to like are they making progress yes mm -hmm. and you know when you're adding volume like, you know, okay, I'm adding additional sets this mesocycle for this muscle group. Um, and so I, I think the biggest thing is progressing volume based off outcomes rather than assumptions. Because mm -hmm. um, we, we don't want to assume that someone's volume is going to increase if they're already yeah. um, making progress. So, you know, rather than coming up with, you know, crazy calculations of, of volume, um, yeah, something like hard sets and just having, you know, a range, um, you know, like if they're doing, you know, 15 to 20 sets per body part per week um, and they tend to plateau, you may have to have like a specialization phase where you, you know, bump it up to, you know, 20 to 25 um, yeah. while you put other, you know, muscle groups on the, on the back burner or maintenance phase, like you said. So, um, but yeah, let, listen, be, be reactive with trading volume rather than I think proactive. And mm -hmm. That's going to make the process of tracking it a lot easier because you can just look at a, you know, create a general level, you know, sort of what you would consider average. If you've never worked with the athlete, you have no training history on them in the past. Like let's start in the middle range, you know, 12 to 20 sets per body part per week look at okay did they progress if they progressed you don't really need to change anything um, mm -hmm. if they didn't progress 
you know, first, sometimes here's one thing to mention. If, if, they're, if they did not progress, it's not necessarily that they need new, more training volume. You want to look at the variables that could be, you know, explaining that lack of progress outside of simply volume. Is sleep down? Because say they're not progressing because their recovery is shit. Adding more training volume is not going to solve that problem. It's mm -hmm. just going to make it worse. So you want to have a system, um, this is where systems come in especially handy, a system of assessing when it's time to adjust volume if they're not progressing. So if their outcome is indicating we, you know, we need more volume or this level of volume could be questionable, then have a system to confirm whether or not that's the case. And I think looking at you know, energy balance, sleep, stress, all of that's going to be useful information um, because you, know, you can't break through plateaus, every plateau with additional volume some of those plateaus you're just going to make worse so um but yeah tangent but yeah hard sets is probably the the most practical way to do it mm -hmm. um i do think that james um krieger's hypertrophy load volume or volume load it makes the most sense and i think it's probably the most predictive um but it's harder to track in practice and on the fly so um tonnage I think is all but worthless unless you're looking at, um, you know, the same muscle group or the same movement mm. over a, a long period of time. Um, but I think hard sets and, you know, average intensity is going to be kind of your, your biggest uh, players there. Awesome. Well, there's one more. How do you go about program for physique athletes post contest to make the most of their increased nutrient anabolic sensitivity whilst taking into account possible adaptive resistance that occurs after prolonged periods of high volume training? Um, do you implement low volume phases, strength maintenance phase, resensitize to the high volume training stimulus? Cool. Um, Brian? Yeah. Um... I think the, the, P, the nutrient and anabolic sensitivity after training or after a prep um, is simply energy balance related um, more than anything. I, I don't think, I mean, you're, you're at a greater ability to increase size because you're going from a deficit to a surplus. Um, you know, you may have a, you, you will likely have a higher state of insulin sensitivity when you're um, leaner, but ultimately you're you're just creating a caloric environment that's conducive to to building muscle, and that's the biggest thing. I will I will take a um, controversial stance on the adaptive resistance component. Um, I think it's plausible. I don't think we have proof that high volume training um, in and of itself creates adaptive resistance. I think it's more that we need, as long as you have some type of progressive stress, then mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if that adaptive resistance would occur. Um, and this is a conversation you know, I've had with like Eric Helms um, in the past. And I, I think it's, my stance on it is if you're creating overload over time and you're not progressing take a deload and then start over um, but I do like one reason of implementing you know higher intensity phases is you know increasing their their strength um, I honestly do that more with physique athletes just for as a novel experience rather than a novel stimulus um, like if you increase your one RM, a lot of people say, well, if you run a strength phase, then you get stronger and you can train at high, higher rep ranges, you know, with more weight. Like that's true, but you know, the sort of the principle of specificity, like if, if I want to increase my 12 RM, what's the best way to do that? To train at one RM or to train my, you know, in that 12 RM range. And it's probably going to be trained in that 12 RM range. Um, so yes, it, it will increase the weights you can use in those higher rep ranges, but it's not the reason I would 
mm. utilize one of those because you should be getting stronger in those rep ranges anyway. Um, I think that, like I said, I don't want to rule out the idea. I mean, we know anabolic resistance occurs. Um, you know, it, for example, like in the elderly, you know, you see a decreased, you know, synthetic response to protein feeding as they get older. Like that is an anabolic kind of resistance. Um, so what adaptive resistance would have to mean is like the same level of overloading stimulus is causing, you know, a progressively smaller, um, like a smaller response. Mm. And, and I'm not sure that's the case if you're implementing overload um, over time. And so I, I don't know if, uh, if the low volume phases are required for a, for a, certainly for a power lifter, but for a physique athlete, um, I'm not convinced. I think there, they can be a period where you just reduce fatigue, um, and enter the next high volume phase with a higher level of preparedness, um, and ability to create subsequent overload. But I don't think any in and of itself, it's like rebooting the system where volume is then going to have a um, greater, you know, protein synthetic um, yeah. outcome. So awesome. I, I went really off on that one and I'm no, not that's sure. Good. That makes sense. Yeah, it did. Well, that's the final question. Guys, uh, thank you for staying with us. Thank you for all the brilliant questions. Brian, as always, appreciate your time uh, and then some. Um, and we'll speak to you all next time. Thanks, guys. Cool. Thank you, man. Oh, I'm so sorry. That last it. one makes – I felt like I, was, I went off topic on that.